Hello. Uh, my name is Jenny Costa. Oops. And I'm going to break the slides. Okay, here I am. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have any, you know, pancakes to talk about, or I don't have any little activities for us to do. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit, a bit of a story um, about my own experience. Um, and I want to talk about a mistake that teachers, like, like me, um, who have the best of intentions, a mistake that we sometimes make with learning by making. And I'm going to start with a story about how I did exactly that. So I started teaching at the South Shore Charter Public School in 2009. Um, so SSTPS is, as you can probably get from the name, a charter school. It was one of the first ones in Massachusetts. Um, and it was founded in 1995 by a group of parents and educators who really wanted to focus on experiential learning. They didn't really call it project-based learning or learning by making or anything like that at that point, but they wanted to focus on what they called experiential learning. And one of the ways that they did this from the very beginning was what, what they called workshops. And so these workshops were a chance for the teachers and the students to learn by exploring something that they were passionate about. Um, and they did things like they had fashion shows, they had um, poetry slams and plays, they went to work on local farms or cleaning up beaches. They even bought a diesel van and converted it to run on vegetable oil, which is very fun. Um, and so when I started at the school, I was told that I would teach, I would run one of these workshops. And it should be themed around something that I was passionate about, but the, the class itself, the specific things that we did should be all student directed. There was no curriculum. We didn't, we could do pretty much whatever we wanted. The requirement, really, the only requirement was that my students would present two what we called exhibitions of mastery per year. And I was a high school teacher, and so a lot of these kids had been at the school since kindergarten, and so they should be super familiar with this student-directed, this student-led workshop culture. So this was supposed to be easy. Um, so I and another teacher who was new to the school, we ended up taking over the environmental workshop. It was the one that ran the veggie van. Um, and we walked in the first day, and we essentially said, hey, so what do you guys want to do? Um, so yeah, that did not go well. Um, at first we got <laughs> very little response, but um, eventually students did start coming up with different projects that they wanted to do. And they were really cool projects. So there was one group who wanted to take over and like focus on the veggie van, maintaining it, and um, figuring out how to track the carbon savings from it. Um, and that was kind of our responsibility anyway, so that was good that they wanted to do that. Um, there was another student who wanted to try to breed zebrafish and try to see if he could get different genetic modifications to occur. Specifically, he wanted to make them glow in the dark. Um, and then there was a group who just said they wanted to research wolves. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you can see the level of complexity, the level of feasibility, the topics, they were all wildly different. And I was new to the school completely new to experiential learning, as was my co-teacher. And so we, we just said yes to everything. Um, and so the results were also a little bit all over the place. The veggie van group, they were actually really successful. So they made this training manual that they would get, give to the teachers so they could take the veggie van on field trips. Um, and so they knew that they had to like start it out on diesel, run it on diesel till it warmed up then switch over to veggie oil, then purge it with diesel again when they got to where they were going. And then they came up with this mileage tracking system and they got all the teachers to use it when they took the van out. And then they researched how to calculate the carbon savings from those miles tracked and plot it over the course of the school year. So their project was awesome, it was really, really successful. Um, the zebrafish project, um, we, we went through a few zebrafish. Um, and the project's <laughs> focus, it's subtle, I know. Um, <laughs> the project's focus kind of shifted over time into how to set up and how to maintain an aquarium um, and how to get the fish to live long enough so that they will lay eggs. Um, and the wolves group, they eventually kind of narrowed in their focus and figured out really what they wanted to do. They focused in on looking at population changes after wolves had been reintroduced to Yellowstone Park. But they spent a lot of time early on sort of floundering around, not really knowing where to go with their research. 
And I spent a lot of time floundering around too, not really knowing um, what kind of help to give or how much help to give, and just how student-led this workshop experience was really supposed to be. So what was my mistake here? Or more accurately, what were like my many mistakes here? Um, I had made the structure too open and too unfocused. There really was no structure. Uh, so I had created this environment where some highly motivated students might thrive and might make progress, but some who needed more support were going to get left behind. I had let the workshop community become fragmented, so they were all working on such disparate projects that any sort of meaningful collaboration between these different groups uh, was kind of impossible. So the good news is that um, I taught at SSCPS for eight more years and I got better at workshop. <laughs> so this is me with my, my group for my second year there. This was a, an engineering work, uh, workshop. Because environmentalism was something that I was interested about, but I wouldn't really describe it as my passion. So I tried a few different things, eventually ended up landing on what I called a maker's workshop. Um, and more importantly, I started giving my students or starting out with these smaller projects before they branched out and did the kind of the bigger things where they had much more freedom. Um, and so, and I chose projects that would teach them specific skills like 2D design, 3D design, or electronics, things like that. And in these projects, I tried to leave room for experimentation and for tinkering. So like this one was one where they had to make um, these vinyl cut stickers that would incorporate sticky LEDs. So the platform piece was they had to design the stickers in Inkscape, they had to cut them out on our vinyl cutter, um, they had to figure out where they wanted to place the LEDs and then where should they put the copper tape and the batteries and things to make them light up. But within that, they had freedom to make some choices. So they could use any sort of different 2D design techniques they wanted um, in designing the shapes, they could choose to use one LED or more than one LED. They could, um, or some of them ended up trying to make their stickers multicolored by designing them in different layers and then cutting those layers out of different pieces of vinyl and like stacking them. Um, and then we were able to kind of put their different stickers together into this big kind of glowing poster. It was really cool. And the idea was that now that they've done all this, this is stuff that they know how to do, right? These are skills that they could take into other projects. And at the end of the year, the projects that all the different students are working on are still pretty diverse, but we're speaking the same language, right? And we're working from the same set of skills. So we're all here tonight because we're interested in learning by making, right? And in doing projects with students. And we've heard a lot about some really amazing projects with students. Um, and we approach this with a lot of enthusiasm and we wanna give our learners agency and, you know, the ability to express themselves and all of that is great. But we can sometimes fall into this trap of giving our students too much freedom. And we say things like, follow your passion, or make whatever you want, right? And what we fail to give them in that instance is a starting point, like a platform where they can take off with a little bit more substance behind them. So projects like the ones I did that first year um, might be called unfocused projects. So all the students start at different places, and some of those places might have a little bit more focus to them, might be more well-defined, but most of them will be kind of fuzzy. And over time, students make progress, a lot or a little. Some students get stuck, and at the end of the time period, the, you know, the quarter, the year, whatever we've imposed, the results are pretty scattered. Usually so much so that like this group over here can't really talk with their work um, about with that group over there because they just don't have that much in common. The communities of discourse that might have existed within the room have become fragmented. Um, and we're teachers, right? So we want to think about what students are learning from these types of projects. And turns out that is fragmented too, right? So one group, like my Wolves group, they might have been entirely focused on doing research and developing a report. But then another group might have been much more hands-on and doing things like tweaking those systems in the aquarium or collecting those zebrafish eggs. And then the idea of trying to figure out a way to assess all this fairly and think about skills that everybody has worked on developing, it's, it's pretty much impossible. And then there's kind of the other extreme 
you know, the thing that I was trying so hard to avoid would be these more closed projects. And so these are the ones where students are making, but they're all making the same thing from the same set of directions. And kids are kids, so they're not all going to make progress at the same rate. But the best case scenario, right, the best case is that everybody has the same thing that works in the same way at the end. And maybe they can talk to each other, right? They have enough in common for that. But there is not a whole lot to talk about, right? The community of discourse there is very, very rigid and very restricted. And so what I learned, uh, sorry. Um, and so what students can learn from those types of projects before we get to what I actually learned, um, well, they can learn some specific skills, right? So they can learn like how to solder, um, they can learn some coding skills, you know, things like that. Um, and if they have something that doesn't work right the first time, they might learn some, you know, the importance of being precise or the importance of using tools properly. But what they miss out on is problem solving, right? Because all the problems have already been solved for them. And what they miss out on is creativity. And we, in trying to create something that's easy to assess, because there is a so-called correct version, all we really end up being able to assess is how well our students can follow directions. And so now what I learned um, is that in designing projects, this balance between agency and support is really, really important. Um, and so now when I'm uh, designing projects as part of the learning team at PyTop, that's the balance that I'm trying to strike. So. These projects we might call open projects. Um, so there is a platform that, you know, several people have kind of talked about these ideas, but they have this platform that is uh, this common starting point that everybody can kind of pick up from. And from there, students start to kind of play around with it. They start to test out different things. They start to see where its limits are, and they make kind of their own branched out versions of this platform. And then once they have learned what they can from these platforms, once they've gotten an understanding of how they work, now they can really take off and they can make something that is unique and that's personalized to them. And so the results do end up pretty scattered. There's a lot of diversity here. But because they all started from that same platform, they have enough in common that we can have this discourse community. And so maybe a modification that this group made might kind of spark an idea in this group and then they decide that they want their projects to work together um, and you make this like kind of awesome mega project and now you have this real community and these ideas that one student might not have come up with on their own, now they can be born from the whole group. So in our framework, we've given names to these different steps and so you've heard about these names before but we can kind of illustrate them in a, a slightly different way. So we have the Assemble, which is that platform, right, where it starts off a little bit more closed, um, where they do have these um, specific instructions, because we do want that focus on um, skill development. We do want students to think about being precise and to give them that starting point. But from there, they start to tinker, right? They um, kind of play around with that starting point a little bit, so they start to see, you know, what happens if I change this line of code or if I attach this piece differently and we can see that the scope of the project is starting to widen out a little bit. And then once they have that information from tinkering, now they can really think about purpose, right? They can think about what do I want my project to do? And so they get to the play phase where what they're playing with is the design, the construction. You know, how do I adapt this platform that I made way back here to serve the purpose that I've now chosen? And then finally, in the share phase is where we get that discourse community, right, where you can maybe combine two different projects, or you can have a competition, or you can compare and contrast how these different projects. And all through this whole set, the scope of the projects just widens, and they can do more and more and more as they go through these different phases. And again, as teachers, we want to think about the learning that's happening during these different phases. Um, and so during Assemble and Tinker, they are, as we said, learning those skills. They're doing this focused investigation where they are, um, you know, figuring out what the constraints of their platform are, 
how their platform works, kind of really getting that understanding. They're making those small modifications and getting a little bit more information from it each time. And then once they have that information, they can start to make those big changes, maybe even redesign the entire platform. And that takes creativity, that takes problem solving, that takes design thinking or data analysis. And then the share phase takes all of those skills as well, but then it also brings in collaboration and presentation. But because of the way this is structured, because it all started from the same platform and it's got this structure of kind of gradually broadening out, they're all still speaking that common language. And so there are those common skills that can be meaningfully assessed. So we think that this framework has the power to make learning by making more accessible um, and more powerful than it can be with teachers like I was sort of floundering around and trying to figure it out on their own. Um, and we think that by doing these types of projects or these types of projects, you know, students are getting a lot more than the content that they might be expected to see on a standardized test. They're getting these skills that we've been talking about that can help them meet the challenges of a changing world and can help them learn more about themselves and to be able to really have the time and the space to focus on what they're passionate about. And we hope that you guys will all agree as well. Thank you.